Hi everyone, this is Jace with Conquering the NPTE. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about some neuromuscular concepts because we're gonna be covering the topic of stroke. Let's go. So first, let's define a stroke. In the most basic terms, a stroke is simply a lack of blood flow to the brain. Now, when we have a lack of blood flow, we're also gonna have a lack of oxygen. And as we know, our brain and our heart are two vital organs for us not only to survive, but also to thrive. And our brain requires a significant amount of oxygen all the time. If we don't have blood flow to the brain, that's gonna be a problem. So have you ever wondered why you had to learn that maze of vessels in your anatomy class, in addition to the muscle attachments and origins? There's actually a pretty good reason. So we have three major arteries supplying most of our brain. And today I wanna to give you a quick and easy way to remember the clinical syndromes of those three cerebral arteries. So let's start by reviewing our brain lobes. We have our frontal lobe anteriorly, our parietal lobe just posterior to that, our temporal lobe immediately inferior to both of those, and last our occipital lobe at the very posterior part of our brain. Our frontal lobe deals mainly with motor planning and function. Our parietal lobe deals with sensory input and the perception that we have of our world. Our temporal lobe is our main auditory cortex and our occipital lobe is our main visual cortex. Now you have to understand that by no means are those functions for each lobe exhaustive. We just wanted to make it really simple so that all you had to do is remember one function per lobe so that when you're trying to recall what an anterior cerebral artery stroke might look like in a patient, you can do so with relative ease. Okay, now onto our arteries. Let's take a look at the anatomy. We've got three major arteries supplying most of our cortex. That's our anterior cerebral artery, our middle cerebral artery, and our posterior cerebral artery. If we take a look here at our anterior cerebral artery, we can see that it runs, well, anteriorly. So that's easy to remember. And it's a, one of the main arteries that supplies our frontal lobe. You can also see that this artery runs directly in between the two hemispheres, kind of in our longitudinal fissure. So recall the function that we paired with the frontal lobe. We said that it was mainly responsible for our motor planning and function. So we're definitely gonna expect to see some sort of motor deficit if we have an anterior cerebral artery stroke. And in fact, a telltale sign of an ACA stroke is that we're gonna see some contralateral hemiparesis or hemiplegia, and it's going to affect the lower extremities more than the upper extremities. Now remember that hemiparesis and hemiplegia are just fancy terms for weakness or paralysis of one side of the body. So why are the lower extremities more affected than the upper with our ACA? One word, homunculus. But this is really why we need to know our anatomy. So our homunculus is simply a map that's housed on the cortex of our brain about the rest of our body. If we take a look here at our precentral gyrus and we pick it up and take it out of our brain and we look at the cross section, we can see our homunculus map. Notice that our lower extremity hangs down sort of in the longitudinal fissure right there of our brain. Well, we know the anterior cerebral artery supplies not only the frontal lobe, but it runs in that longitudinal fissure. That's why we're gonna see the lower extremity is more affected than the upper extremities when we talk about our hemiparesis and our hemiplegia. But hemiparesis is not the only symptom we're going to see in an anterior cerebral artery stroke. So let's take a look at some other symptoms that we're likely to see and try to understand why we might see those with this particular stroke. So as you can see with our list here, we could also see Broca's aphasia, we could see apraxia, we could see contralateral neglect, we could see contralateral cortical type sensory loss, and we can see a varying degree of some frontal lobe dysfunctions. So how are we gonna remember all of these? Well, we're gonna go back to our anatomy. Both Broca's aphasia and apraxia still have something to do with our motor function. Broca's area is situated in the lateral premotor cortex in our frontal lobe. It's adjacent to all the areas of our primary motor cortex that are involved in moving our lips, our tongue, our face, and our larynx. 
This is why Broca's aphasia is known as the expressive aphasia or the motor aphasia. And it's defined as the fact that we can't produce language very well. Apraxia is a term for deficits in our motor conceptual conceptualization, motor planning, and motor execution. So Broca's will only occur with a dominant anterior cerebral artery stroke. That's usually on our left side. And apraxia is also correlated with a left ACA stroke. So those two are a little bit easy to remember together because usually they're gonna occur together. Now, the other symptoms on our list aren't tied to our motor function. So it's a little bit tricky because that was the point of making this simple was just learning one function per lobe. But this still applies because we just need to know what our function of our parietal lobe was. And if you remember, our parietal lobe is mainly responsible for our sensory input and our perception of the world. So if we look again at our anterior cerebral artery anatomy, we're gonna notice that not only does it supply the frontal lobe, but do you see how far it runs posteriorly? And in fact, it actually supplies a little bit of our parietal lobe as well. So we talked about having a dominant anterior cerebral artery stroke, but if we have a non-dominant stroke, then we might see something called contralateral neglect. This is due to the fact that the ACA supplies a little bit of our parietal lobe, which we said was responsible for perception. So if we have an infarct to that part of the lobe, then you might see some neglect. Then we can also see some contralateral cortical type sensory loss. Again, our lower extremities are gonna be more affected than our upper extremities because that homunculus map also applies to our sensory cortex. We've got a motor homunculus and we've got a sensory homunculus. It also makes sense that we may see a little bit of cortical type sensory loss because again, that anterior cerebral artery supplies just a little bit of our parietal lobe, which is most of our sensory input. Now, when we say cortical type sensory loss, we don't mean sensory loss of our normal sensations. We're talking about things like decreased stereognosis or decreased graphesthesia. Our last symptom on our ACA list is a varying degree of frontal lobe dysfunction, which makes sense since we said the anterior cerebral artery supplies most of our frontal lobe. Some of those dysfunctions can include a return of the grasp reflex, an altered mental status, and impaired judgment. Our next major artery is our middle cerebral artery. An MCA infarct is one of the most common strokes you're going to see, and so you will likely work with a patient that has an MCA stroke. Now our middle cerebral artery runs in many places, so it covers a lot of territory. This makes it a little difficult to estimate what signs and symptoms we might see because we're gonna see a lot of variety in these types of strokes. But there are still a few key symptoms that we tend to pair with middle cerebral artery. So let's take a look at our checklist of signs and symptoms for middle cerebral artery. So we could see contralateral hemiparesis and hemiplegia, and in this case, we're gonna see the upper extremities in the face more affected than our lower extremities. We could also see some contralateral hemisensory loss. Again, the upper extremities in face more affected than the lower extremities. We could see some aphasia, and there's a few kinds we'll talk about. We could see something called homonymous hemianopsia, and we can also see some hemineglect. Because the middle cerebral artery supplies a little bit of our frontal lobe, we can use our homunculus here again. So we've got some contralateral hemiparesis and hemiplegia, and if we're looking at our middle cerebral artery, that's gonna be responsible for the rest of our homunculus, so our upper extremities and our face. We can apply the same concept to the sensory homunculus. Again, our upper extremity and our face is gonna be the most affected. Now, a big piece of middle cerebral artery signs and symptoms is aphasia. We could have Broca's aphasia, or we could have Wernicke's aphasia. Or since the middle cerebral artery is so big, we could have both. And that's what we call global aphasia. Let's look one more time at our anatomy. So our Broca's area, as we've talked before, sits near this frontal lobe, but our Wernicke's area sits right at the edge of our lateral sulcus, sort of where the parietal, occipital, and temporal lobe all come together. Now that should be a key thing for you to remember because if all the sensory inputs are affected with one part, the Wernicke's area, 
then we can easily remember that Wernicke's is going to be a receptive aphasia, meaning we cannot intake information very well. We wouldn't understand the information that might be told to us or information that we might see or information that we could gain through any of our other sensory channels. Now, if you see a patient with global aphasia, which remember is both Broca's and Wernicke's, then you know that this middle cerebral artery stroke is a massive stroke because it's covered both of those areas. It's covered our frontal lobe, our parietal lobe, and parts of our temporal and occipital lobe. So the middle cerebral artery will supply some of our occipital lobe as well. It pretty much supplies a little bit of all of our lobes. And this is where we could see something called homonymous hemianopsia. Both eyes have some sort of visual deficit and it's on the same side in each eye. So in this case, we can see that the right side of each eye is basically blank. And that is what we call right homonymous hemianopsia. The patient can only see half of their world. And our last symptom on our list, our hemineglect, can occur because that middle cerebral artery supplies a significant amount of our parietal lobe, which we said is responsible for our perceptual function. So you might see all kinds of neglect here. When we say hemineglect, it's usually that the patient is gonna ignore one side completely of their environment. So a really good example of this is if you have a patient with hemineglect and they're eating, you might see them only eat one side of their plate. That's because they don't even know the other half is there. All right, and finally we have our posterior cerebral artery, the last of our three major arteries that supplies our cortex. Now this artery mainly runs posterior, and we know that our occipital lobe is mainly posterior. So this one is pretty easy. There's not a ton of signs and symptoms. One, because the only thing that's usually affected is the occipital lobe, which is visual. And two, because there are as many other arteries in that posterior part of our circulation. So even if the posterior cerebral artery has a block, most of the time, the rest of the circulation can make up for that. And you won't really see a lot of signs and symptoms. So if we look at our list of signs and symptoms, we're gonna start with our homonymous hemianopsia, which we saw with our middle cerebral artery as well. This is one of many visual deficits that we might see with the posterior cerebral artery, but it's one of the most common. And we could also see a contralateral sensory loss of our pain and temperature with this kind of stroke. And this is usually when we have a larger posterior cerebral artery infarct, uh, one that might include the thalamus or the internal capsule. Well, that's it for our signs and symptoms of our three major cerebral arteries. Hopefully that gave you a way to remember a little easier the signs and symptoms that are associated with each artery based on where you know they run and what you know they supply and what that lobe functions for. Thanks for watching. Below you will find some links to a review questions and quiz as well as the answer key. See you next time.